Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and happy Thursday, November 2nd, 2023. Welcome back to Weather Center Nazario. Today we have not a whole lot to talk about, but some interesting news to pass along to you guys, and we're going to cover a very large AOR, so forgive me if it does seem I'm fairly brief with certain details. I'm going to make sure to hit every single area of responsibility I've been reporting on since we started this channel, but we're going to be going across North America, down into Central America, through the Caribbean, and out into the Atlantic for that matter. So fasten your seatbelts, guys. Let's get started. So we are now about 29 days away from the conclusion of hurricane season 2023, and we still have Invest 97L out there. I want to use gigantic air quotes with this one because to tell you the truth, it's not looking too good on satellite, nor has it over the last couple of days. National Hurricane Center has a 20-20% for both the next two days and the next seven days in terms of its formation probabilities. I'm honestly astonished we're still carrying this as an Invest Invest area because once we get over to the satellite imagery, you can see honestly a lot of the thunderstorm activity that we're expecting with this is either off out in front of it to the west, already impacting Central America, off to the north between that air mass interaction created by our frontal system coming down off the United States and all that warm air still situated out over the Caribbean Sea and down to the south. So honestly, we're seeing more of our thunderstorm activity with this out and around it as opposed to with this disturbance in of itself. All right, so here we go. We're looking at our clean long wave infrared satellite for most of the northern hemisphere, at least on the western side where we can see most of North America, Central America, and the upper periphery of South America for that matter. You can see we have a very deep occluded low that drags a frontal boundary all the way down as far southwest as the East Pacific Ocean. We have a very, very long boundary of cold air that has worked its way off the greater United States. You can see a lot of the open cell cumulus and the cloud streets just upstream of it on the satellite imagery here. Very good indication that you've had frontal passage, and for much of the eastern seaboard, and I can speak specifically for Central Florida, for that matter, we've had a lot of elevated winds throughout the day, 20, 30 miles per hour, sometimes gusting even higher than that, not only because of the pressure gradient surrounding that high pressure coming down that's bringing that cool air, but because of what's called cold air advection or the movement of cold air across our neck of the woods. As you can see, because of this frontal boundary, we do have quite a bit of action going on down in the Caribbean, Cuba, parts of Jamaica, the Cayman Islands, extending into Nicaragua, Honduras, and Belize, for that matter, are seeing sporadic thunderstorm activity brought on by this cold and warm interaction between the front and what we have situated out there over the Caribbean Sea, more or less marinating as what we still have our warm equatorial tropical weather. Now, as I mentioned, when we're looking at National Hurricane Center's page, you really can't discern or discriminate what it is that Invest 97L is doing out there. We have widespread thunderstorm activity encompassing much of the Caribbean. The further east you go, it tries to dissipate a little bit, although we have some thunderstorm action starting to bloom for Trinidad, Tobago, trying to reach its way into Barbados, but much of the windward leeward islands are unscathed at this time. I do anticipate a lot of this storm coverage is going to stay over the South American continent, but it could try to spread north into the Lesser Antilles. But again, all in all, guys, we have thunderstorm activity going on pretty much everywhere around our invest area, so I'm quite surprised that National Hurricane Center is still carrying it as an area of investigation. The rest of the tropics are quiet, expected to remain that way, and over the United States, we have our next frontal system making its way into the Pacific Northwest, increasing our rain and higher terrain snow probabilities for that matter. And if you take a look up over Canada, extreme northern Canada. Some of my old friends in Air Force weather would get a little frustrated with me saying this, but it looks like we have a bit of a polar vortex starting to take shape over Hudson Bay, maybe just to the north of that general region. So all in all, we're really looking at crystal clear weather for much of the lower 48, especially closer to the Great Lakes, the eastern seaboard where we just had frontal passage. We're looking very good down here in the southeast and the deep south. Even the desert southwest is looking pretty good in terms of significant weather. Now, normally I wouldn't highlight this on infrared. I would use more water vapor, but if you look right in through here, there's a little bit of a streak of higher level cloud cover working its way through the Texas panhandle. There's a little weak shortwave trough that's currently traveling through where our upper level polar front jet is moving across the United States, kind of like in this fashion where I have it drawn feeding into our barotropic low moving further and further into the North Atlantic on the right hand side of the screen. The reason I bring this up is as we go over the next three to five days, especially into this weekend, Saturday and especially Sunday, as the shortwave propagates off to the east, we're looking at maybe some weak cyclogenesis taking place off the southeastern coastline. And what that means is as that low can begin to form, we're going to start seeing this area of temperature 
temperature discontinuity or that contrast between our modified polar air to the north of our front and the warm tropical air to the south mixing in. So we're not only going to see a return to form in terms of our warmer weather and our humidity coming back for the southeast, specifically Florida, unfortunately, but we're also going to see east coast Florida rain chances maybe start to go up over the next couple of days. Unfortunately for our folks out there still afflicted by very, very severe drought conditions, I don't see relief in sight, at least for not maybe another seven, eight, nine days max. But hopefully as we transition patterns and we can get some of these very, very deep troughs off the West Coast, you can see very on the left-hand side of the screen here, moving across the U.S., hopefully, hopefully, guys, we can get some rain out there for the Gulf Coast and the western half of the Florida coastline. Now, we're going to quickly look across the North Atlantic, the tropical Atlantic for that matter. I'm going to show you why I do think that hurricane season, even though we have 29 more days, is officially closed for business. So you go through time. This is our 0Z euro. We're looking at the wind shear. And if you look, we have copious amounts of wind shear almost everywhere. In this case, it almost looks like nowhere out there in the Atlantic, the Caribbean, and especially the Gulf of Mexico is favorable for any further tropical cyclone development. There are some very small windows of opportunity for something to try to develop in terms of a wave or a disturbance, an area of disorganized thunderstorms out there in the Caribbean. But as you go through time, even the Caribbean gets smothered up by a lot of our subtropical jet wind shear. And you can see the main development region is encompassed with prevailing westerly winds, inducing tremendous amounts of wind shear out there as well. And as you go towards the very tail end of the loop, you can see our subtropical jet dipping south. And then, guys, it goes without saying, there is no favorable environment anywhere the eye can see on this chart across the Atlantic. So I think it's safe to say we can say bon voyage to the the 2023 hurricane season. Now we're going to go back over North America and show you that when as we go through time, this is once again our 0Z Euro, we're going to be sitting under a zonal pattern for the time being. As we go into this weekend, you do see a weak trough indicative of that frontal system I mentioned on the infrared digging its way across the northern and central portions of the lower 48. But as we go through time, that is not expected to surge too far to the south. It won't be until this very strong finger of jet energy can move into the west coastline are we going to see a deepening frontal system really kick in. We're going to see our snow chances ramp up for the Great Basin Intermountain West, especially the Pacific Northwest, and the Northern Rockies to its entirety for that matter, really begin to kick up. We're going to see a large-scale non-convective wind threat with all the cross-barrier flow running perpendicular to the Rocky Mountains out there, helping to induce and elevate our surface winds, probably anywhere between 30, 35 knots for that matter, as that strong finger of jet energy comes across. And this, I do believe, will hopefully, hopefully guys, I'm going to say it again, bring our rain chances up down here in the southeast because then you can see we also have an even deeper trough just upstream of that as we move into the 11th and the 12th of November. So I'm watching closely. We've been in and out of an El Nino phase. It's very bizarre because all of our models are still calling for a strong El Nino, but I think because of all the hot water we still have out there over the Caribbean, a lot of the Atlantic side of the business is being suppressed and we're really not seeing anything developing down over the deep south to increase our rain chances like we were kind of anticipating earlier as we headed into fall. We're going to do a quick sanity check looking at WPC. There's our current frontal system moving through the pack northwest, the upper Rocky Mountains, bringing in a little bit of elevated snowfall and rain for the lower terrain features out there. And then as that system moves off to the east, you see another frontal system getting ready to work its way in. And then we get down towards the very back end of our mock charts. And you can see that that next frontal system or that next trough I'd mentioned on that 200 millibar chart is draped across much of the U.S., headed towards the southeast. And you can see the Gulf Coast of Texas, Louisiana, is anticipating a little bit of rain from this. So hopefully we can translate that all the way through here to Florida and alleviate a little bit of those drought conditions. We're going to take a quick glance at the long-range GFS just to get a better idea of how much our rain and snowfall chances are going to increase with that next long-range trough. So as you go through time, it looks like we get a little bit of an Alberta clipper with that current trough axis coming across. It doesn't seem like it's going to deepen heavily in amplitude, so I do anticipate that low is going to stay across the northern tier, running pretty much parallel to the Canadian-U.S. border, moving through the Great Lakes, bringing some lake effect and some snowfall to the northeast. And then as we get that next system deepening down, you could see quite a bit of cross-barrier flow, some lease side troughing right in here across New Mexico, the southern tip of Wyoming, and especially Colorado, where that non-convective wind threat is likely to take place. And then we have cyclogenesis happening over Kansas, Oklahoma area, and even into northern portions of Texas. And that's a textbook Texas low, as we like to call it, when we used to use our regime characterizations. And then as you go through time, you can see a little bit of that rainfall tries to surge down across the southeast quadrant.
version of the U.S. So hopefully, again, around the 11th or the 12th of this month, maybe a little after that, we could get just a little bit of that drought relief going on down here across the Gulf Coast and the Florida Peninsula. Now, this I thought was funny. Take this with an enormous grain of salt because, once again, we're still using the GFS. I just thought this was a little funny, and I thought I'd bring it up, but I saw this yesterday at 18Z and overnight at 0Z. The 12Z GFS does have a very low potential that if you look out over the Eastern Caribbean, another tropical entity may try to sneak up on us, guys. And the reason I crack up is because I definitely do not think that's going to happen. Uh, there were a couple of the Euro probabilities hinting on something coming off the Venezuela-Colombia coastline and planting itself in the Southern Caribbean. But as you saw in the European shear models, it doesn't seem like there's going to be any sort of favorable environment for something to cling to down there. So we might get another area of disorganized convection, amping up rain chances for our Caribbean areas, especially Central America. But I don't think that the UGFS is on the money here, thinking that we're going to get a Cat 2 hurricane exiting over Puerto Rico and get pulled out into the Atlantic. But of course, we've had a lot of surprises this hurricane season, so I guess you can say we still have to wait and see. I know a lot of you guys out there definitely like to echo the sentiment of, it ain't over until it's over. So naturally, because there's something popping up out there, I'll take a very quick glance at what we have going on in terms of our probabilities and our ensembles. Nothing yet. Thought it was funny to go ahead and highlight that and just mention that, hey, we are still in hurricane season and the good old GFS is forecasting its usual isms. All right, before we wrap up the video, we're once again looking at our sea surface temp anomaly charts. If you tuned in yesterday, not only for my tropics talk at 8 p.m., but for my full-fledged segment yesterday afternoon, I mentioned that as we get out of the winter time this year, 2023 into early 2024, we're already looking at coming out of El Nino, guys. And what I'm concerned about is how bad our climatology models under forecast just how hot our sea surface temps were, especially in the Gulf and in the Caribbean. They were pretty on the money for in terms of the tropical Atlantic, but the Caribbean Sea especially was severely under forecast. And if you take the CANSIPS CLIMO model through time, you can see as we get into March, April, May of next year, and then eventually June, July, and August, you can see that the model is anticipating that, albeit a little bit less than what we saw this year, I still think this might be a bit of an under forecast. This is a heck of a long way out, so we never know exactly how this is going to verify, and we really won't until this time next year. But you can see that the models are thinking that we will once again be a degree to a degree and a half Charlie warmer than what we were or I should say the climatological norm is for the Caribbean. We can cross reference this with our CFS climatology model and you can see the same thing as we get into the beginning of hurricane season the area of the Caribbean is expected to be about one and a half to almost two degrees Charlie warmer according to the CFS the climate forecasting system. The reason I bring this up is I just want to touch on it one more time that as we transition out of El Nino a lot of our long range ensembles are thinking we will definitely be in a neutral phase as early as February and March, and La Nina may be creeping in as we start off hurricane season 2024. So it goes out saying I'm very, very heavily investigating this, and I'm kind of coming up with some very, very long-range prognoses just to see exactly what the next year hurricane season, even the year after that, may look like with as abnormally hot as our oceans were out there throughout this season. El Nino, for all intents and purposes, was kind of shut down throughout October and now into November, but it goes without saying if it weren't for the effects of El Nino wind shear and the conditions out there in the Caribbean and the Gulf throughout much of August and September, we definitely could have had a lot more serious storms. We could have had many serious storms coming our way in the Caribbean, Central America, and especially the Southeast United States. So I'm definitely keeping an eye out. If we have another elevated window of hot sea surface temps and ridiculous abnormally hot ocean heat content, there could be open season for us out there in the islands of the Caribbean, the Southeast U.S., and especially the Gulf of Mexico where we could have major hurricane after major hurricane coming through, guys. You saw the rapid intensification taking place out in the Atlantic with the likes of Lee, Nigel, even Margo to an extent. And it goes without saying the East Pack was definitely ripe in a blaze with all sorts of storms really deepening rapidly over 12 to 18 hour windows. And I'm just a little nervous, guys, I'll admit. I definitely want to get some early forecast prognosis out there just to let you know that it is on my radar and I'm not going to forget about hurricane season altogether once we say goodbye to this one. Anyways, folks, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the video 
video, guys. I will admit, with this updated look at what the future of hurricane season could look like, it has my gears turning, and I may come out with some new content for you guys as we go through the winter time. We are going to continue our Weather Center segments covering everything weather-related to for North America, the Caribbean, Central America, and the Northern Periphery of South America out there for my folks tuning in. But I also want to bring out some new content for you guys, especially as we begin to prepare for what 2024 may hold, not only in hurricane season, but just year-round weather altogether. So I hope you're open to new ideas. I'm very excited to roll them out to you guys. I definitely want to continue to innovate the channel and reach out to more folks as we hopefully continue to grow, Lord willing. And I can't thank you guys enough for your continued and gracious support as we've come along over the last couple of months, kind of in the heart of hurricane seasons when we first started Weather Center segments. And honestly, I couldn't be more grateful for how much we've grown and only about a two going on a three-month window of time. Anyways, folks, we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much for joining me today on this Thursday, Friday Eve for that matter. We'll see you again tomorrow for our 6 p.m. full-fledged Weather Center segment and our 8 p.m. Tropics Talk. We are winding those down as well, and we will be transitioning from the Tropics Talk live stream. We'll still be holding a live stream, but it won't be tropical related. We'll still talk tropics, of course, because we have a lot of folks down there in the Caribbean, out there in the Atlantic, the Lesser Antilles. Of course, we won't forget about you guys, and I definitely want to continue reporting for all of you tuning in from down in those neck of the woods. But all in all, guys, we're going to be doing some evolving as we go through the next couple of seasons, both winter and spring. So again, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Until next time, this is Weather Center Nazario, signing out.